Good morning uh, from Aberdeen in Scotland. I'm Steve Cromer, the Chair of the Aberdeen Area Committee, and I'd like to present Nigel Robinson, of a Sustainable Director of Apollo, and he's going to talk about a development of moving and electrical quick connect system for a floating renewable devices. Now, during uh, Nigel's talk, if you have any questions, I'd like you to put them into the uh, question at the attendee question box. It'd be real good if we could get some questions before we end, and then I'll ask the questions at the end, and we can have a bit of a chat on uh, the subject matter. So I'll now introduce Nigel. Nigel's a Sustainable Energy Director in Apollo, a UK-based engineering design consultancy. He's a chartered member of the IMEC since uh, 93. He's a 30 years professional experience combining engineering projects with business leadership. He graduated in mechanical engineering from Edinburgh University and obtained a PhD from Cambridge. He then started working with International Marine Consultancy. His professional foundation there was a site in assessment of jack-up drilling units, progressing into support of floating assets such as FPSOs and semi-submersibles. Marine operations, marine warranty, and so on. He's also held senior management roles in the same organisation. He's worked in London, Aberdeen, Kuala Lumpur, and Houston. He's always had the ambition to work on offshore renewable projects, and in recent years this has come about. Today he heads up a group that delivers engineering services into wind, wave, tidal projects. In line with Apollo's motto, he is very much passionate about engineering. So looking into sustainable energy futures. So, Nigel, are you there? Yeah, could you hear me all right, Steve? I can hear you loud and clear. <clears throat> okay. Well, thanks very much, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining uh, this winter webinar. Um, it's uh, If you're like me, you'll be uh, looking forward to taking a few days off, and uh, so I very much appreciate that you're taking time away from last-minute Christmas shopping and so forth to, uh, to sit in and listen to, to this talk. Uh, the subject I'm talking about, as you can see here, is the development, engineering development of a, a mooring and electrical quick connect system for floating renewable energy devices. That's wind wave, wave and tidal devices, really, anything that floats. Uh, there's a constant drive to reduce cost in uh, offshore renewables, especially with uh, floating devices where the, the costs are still relatively high. And uh, we've been working, the quick connection systems are seen as one way of, of getting there and are helping, helping that program along. Uh, for the last two years, uh, the team here in Apollo have been working on a quick connection system, um, funded uh, largely by Wave Energy Scotland and also the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. And we, we've been through a two-year development of which is largely desktop and laboratory scale. And we've just reached this exciting stage where really from January, we're going to start building some hefty bits of steel and, uh, and putting them through their paces. We're going to do factory testing and then we're going to put stuff in the water and start trialing it out. So it's, uh, it's been very, it's a very exciting stage, as I say. Uh, this is by way of an interim update because the program of testing will be, uh, will be informative in itself. But uh, we thought that the learning experience that we've been through might be of interest to the mechanical engineering community. So um, that, that's the purpose of the talk today. So I'm going to go through a bit of background on moorings for offshore renewables. Uh, I'm conscious that not everyone on this call will be um, uh, particularly closely involved in mooring design or, or uh, assurance or operation. So some background on that I thought would be quite useful. And then going into the rationale, why, why quick connection systems? Why are they a good idea? Uh, following that, to start talking through the design decisions and the, the technical decisions we've made on the way to evolve uh, what we call the PALM, which is the Pool and Lock Marine Connector. Uh, so it's a little acronym there. Um, so we've gone from concept through all the way through to feed and actually up to a prototype, which is the various snapshots that you can see here. Uh, some words about the physical testing program that's coming up and where that leaves us in terms of technology readiness levels and uh, a look ahead to commercialization of the product. So thinking of the, the moorings, um, starting with wave energy converters, well, it's, it's still quite a, quite a dynamically changing sector. And there's almost as many mooring configurations as there are concepts for wave energy converters. Uh, these are some of the ones that we've seen in recent months. Um, on the top left, you've got Motion Energy's Blue Star uh, project, which is a floating 
uh, hinge structure, so it needs to move quite dynamically. And they've selected a, a three-leg single point uh, mooring with catenary, catenary mooring legs and an integrated cable. Uh, that's a kind of uh, system that would allow quite a lot of motion of the device, uh, which is ideal for the purposes uh, that, that they have in terms of energy conversion. It's the, the relative motion of the, the, the floating body, which, um, which generates the power. You get a different approach in the top right. That's Marine Power Systems uh, wave sub device, where the hull has to be restrained uh, relative to these barrel-like structures that you can see floating over it. And the relative motion there generates a power takeoff. So in that case, the, the mooring system um, is based on a, a tension leg system. You can see the vertical lines just perhaps with some uh, diagonal stays or, or top legs that are holding it in place. So in this case, the opposite is true of the first one where you, you're wanting the hull to be quite static and then relative motion is elsewhere. So a tension leg mooring or a top leg mooring would be quite a good solution for that. Uh, there are other solutions around. You've got like sort of spread mooring. The bottom right is Bombora, is one of the Bombora early concepts for their floating M-wave device, where they this they have catenary lines coming off the corner of each semi-sub. In this case, you can have motion in all six degrees of freedom, but it's restrained. So it's it's, it's quite a a straightforward way of uh, achieving a, mo uh, a mooring, but it does have a degree of uh, dynamics about it, whereas uh, others like the top left, they would allow weather veining. The one in the bottom right doesn't really allow weather veining uh, because it's not necessary for the concept. But there's some, some quite quite different uh, devices out there. The bottom left is uh, Carnegie Clean Energy's uh, CETO 6 design where you've got uh, this, this red hull structure is submerged. It's actually fully submerged. And then uh, the spread mooring system in this case has a variable geometry. So the mooring lines pay in and pay out, and that's part of their power takeoff. So you get all sorts of shapes and sizes. There is a lot of commonality in the underlying equipment, the, the, the use of chain, the use of wire, use of uh, fiber ropes, and all the joining materials and the anchors. Uh, but the configurations are really quite different from one to the other. And that's because it's, it's a relatively new uh, type of technology. Turning to floating offshore wind, you do get more convergence. There's a lot of talk of spread moored systems, three leg spread moored systems, as you see on the left hand side there. So there's one for a spar, one for a semi sub. In this case, the the, the spread moored solution is fine because you don't have to rotate the, the hull structure. The, any kind of weather veining requirement can be taken out at the nacelle up at the top of the, the wind turbine. Uh, but they're not the only answers that are going around, whether it's three legs or six legs. It's, there's, project specific debate going on there. And then you get to tot leg mooring systems and you get permutations over in the right hand side, uh, which I'll touch on there. So ultimately what the mooring system is doing, it's got a tough job to do. It's, it's fundamentally it's keeping the export cable within its, uh, within its range of allowable displacements and, and preventing collisions, but and also preventing total station keeping loss. It has to do that through the life of the asset and that could be decades. And because um, any any kind of interruption to uh, that functionality implies downtime, it's just expensive, it's loss of production, and, and the, the marine operations associated with intervening in any uh, uh, mooring issue are, are quite expensive. So this is where uh, quick connection systems do come into the into the picture. Um, when you have such a tough job. There is fortunately a load of experience to draw on. I'm going to just skip past this slide because I think I've kind of covered it. But uh, the oil and gas industry in the early days of floating production in particular had learned a lot about making the moorings work for the full life of the asset. Um, FPSOs uh, are in some ways are similar to some of the devices I've just shown you. Uh, you've got a floating hull. You've got in the FPSO case, it's the, the mooring is keeping the production riser within its envelope as opposed to an electrical cable, but it's conceptually quite similar. What the floating production sector found in its early days of operation was that um, there was quite an aggressive failure rate in the moorings and it was for unforeseen reasons. So systems that were put in place to operate for say 20 years without intervention they were experiencing uh, failures in the early days of the asset. And, and someone did a, a calculation of an average failure rate in say the North Sea FPSOs and they estimated of all systems, on average it was about nine years before there was a mooring failure. So this is uh, 
this is a reflective of the challenge that any mooring system has to face. And it, the same will be true in the offshore renewables. There will be challenges like this. Fortunately, there's a lot of learning that's gone into this because naturally the oil and gas industry would respond to that. And you can see some of the guidance documents are there. If you want to look into that, um, I've put a, a rather shameless plug for a paper that a, a colleague, Scott Rosie, and I produced earlier in the year, but it's not really for that purpose. It, it's really to give you an index of where you can find out more information on marine integrity issues. So the, there's a reference down the bottom there if you want to get a copy of the paper and find out a bit more about this. So there's a lot of, lot of useful learning. It's something that we wanted to put into any design that we had for a quick connection system. Um, but we also have to take into account that there are differences. A floating production asset is a standalone system, whereas we're looking at arrays of systems. And generally, there's less redundancy in any one mooring system in a, an offshore renewables array. So if you have three legs versus eight plus legs for an FPSO. So there are some differences and there's some risk specific aspects that have to be taken into account. So what about quick connection systems? Well, <clears throat> if, you have, uh, if you're putting a mooring system out into a, a relatively novel uh, floating device, it, it may be a, a good strategy to um, take that, back to, that hull back to port periodically to, um, to inspect what's happening there. Um, that, that could be a, a sensible strategy for going forward. So if you're going to do that, you don't want to waste time uh, disconnecting because you're losing production time you're incurring a lot of marine spread time. Uh, there's other reasons as well. There's a report that came out uh, from the Carbon Trust, I think it was this year, where they published some of the results of a joint industry project into floating wind. And in there, they talk quite a lot about quick connection, quick disconnection systems. In, in the floating wind uh, scenario, the height of the nacelle uh, of the turbine is so far above a floating, dynamically floating structure that there's real challenges with getting crane hooks up there and making, uh, being able to intervene in the, uh, the nacelle height. So the option is discussed about towing the whole thing to port. Now that's, that's quite a big operation, especially when you have arrays of, uh, arrays of um, hulls out in the, out in, the, the North Sea or wherever it is. So uh, you've got to get some efficiencies. So the, the call in this report is for innovative technologies for connection and disconnection. Uh, the wave sector has also been looking at this. Uh, wave Energy Scotland uh, had a specific call, um, a program call for innovations with regards to connection and disconnection of uh, mooring systems and electrical systems in wave devices. Uh, they'd identified that a significant uh, cost of a wave energy project goes into uh, this kind of operation. So they've got a, they, they launched a program uh, to to start targeting cost reductions in this area, and you can see some of the different factors that might contribute to reducing cost in LCOE in this uh, in this little graph up the top right here. So um, this is actually where we got started to get involved in the program. So let, let me just quickly talk about the Wave Energy Scotland uh, program because this is this is our entry point, if if you like, into the whole the whole subject area. Uh, <clears throat> so Wave Energy Scotland have got a series of programs which are to facilitate the production of a wave energy device. Uh, along the bottom here, they've selected a number of. Uh, of innovative wave energy converters that are going through a stage gate process to work their way up into having a proven device. Now, one of the things that was recognized was that there's specific technical issues which can contribute to the success or otherwise of some of these devices. They identified power takeoff mechanisms, materials manufacturing control systems, and quick connection systems as, as, as being um, having an impact on the overall success. So they ran parallel programs uh, which getting specialist companies involved to look at those particular areas. And as those programs come to maturity, they can cross fertilize into the overall wave energy uh, development. And, and the end product is a, a de-risked uh, and uh, proven wave energy device. So um, <clears throat> we, we were quite interested in this when we heard about the quick connection systems. We thought, well, there's something we might have to contribute to this. Uh, we'd been working with a tidal stream developer, uh, Simic Atlantis, who have the Magen project up on the Pendlin Firth and helping them engineer some of their quick connection devices for that. So we thought, well, maybe we can bring some of that learning 
to bear uh, for marine energy devices or wave energy devices. And similarly, bringing forward some of the learning about integrity management in moorings, can we pull that together and come up with a good idea? So, so we decided to enter the competition. Um, there were some of the objectives with the competition that were uh, set uh, by the by the Wave Energy Scotland themselves, and some of them we we set ourselves. So you have them here, maintaining station in operational and survival conditions. So uh, you see these beautiful pictures of devices out in sunny sunset, uh, sunny sunsets, uh, but actually they also have to work in the envir kind of environment you see here with this uh, flotel being bashed by a pretty bad wave. They have to provide a reliable, repeatable electrical connection. There should be a minimized risk to personnel. The impact on energy capture, whatever device is developed, has to allow the energy capture to be efficient, still be efficient, uh, which is actually harder than you might think. Um, then minimizing time on site, reduce the vessels, keep the vessels simple. These are all good things in terms of proving a cost efficient kind of solution. Things that we wanted to set ourselves from the point of view of long-term integrity, avoiding hydraulics and electrical actuation. Uh, we just think that these things will not do well in long term. So can we get rid of those in our design? Wherever the design has to be, it has to be marine, marinized and rugged, it has to be tough. Um, the, the marine environment is pretty brutal. Um, if you've ever watched a Yokohama being thrown around off a crane, uh, the side of a crane vessel during a, a lifting operation, it's, it can be, it, it's, it's quite daunting. So whatever has to be designed has to work with that. And, and the objective is to provide long-term integrity. So these are the objectives that we set ourselves going into the competition. Um, and then we started to design. So uh, the first ideas were sketched up. Uh, I think it was a Friday night at the end of a long week um, with a couple of weeks to go before the competition deadline. So we wanted to conflate two ideas, first of all. Uh, first of all, the, the left-hand side, this is the interface, this is a typical interface between an FPSO and its mooring system. Uh, so the, the hose pipes here, the, there's good designs and there's designs which have had problems over the years. So could we take the good designs forward and put them into, into whatever the concept needed to be? Then over on the right-hand side, you see the Simic Atlantis ARL 1500 turbine, which has, it's a 150 ton turbine, which sits in a gravity-based structure, which is, you can see it in air here in the yellow. That has to be docked in short order, uh, uh, sub C. And so they use a stabbing kind of device here. And this stabbing device, you can pick out that there's a, a course guide system and it allows the, the overall turbine to orientate so that the red device in the bottom right mates with the electrical connection. So it's, it's a course mechanical guide to make an electrical connection. So we wanted to pull that into the sketch as well. And so we, we pulled those two things together. We took the, um, took the guide system, added to a hose pipe, and that was the initial concept. Uh, one thing that immediately jumped out was underneath you've got a cable and a mooring, uh, in this drawing, a mooring ca uh, chain, which has to twist and rotate. So is there any precedence for that? Well, yes, we knew that the tri catenary moored system used in the ICDAM FPSO had something similar. So maybe we put something like that in. So that was the initial sketch. Um, we turned it into a drawing for the purpose of the competition, and it's a, it's a bit, um, it's a bit basic looking back on it, but it was enough to get get us started. Uh, we took a quick change. Uh, we realized that if you could, you get a bit more effective mechanical connection if you could flip the guides upside down. So the idea here is there's a kind of catcher arm, which is read a hose pipe. Um, it it's pulled out the way you pull up this blue uh, plug on a work wire, which is powered by a tug. This is, this is the, the marinized part of it. And then you flip the catcher arm underneath, drop it in, and the guide system allows the orientation and the electrical connection. And that is actually the, the fundamental principle that we've carried all the way through the designs, although it now looks really quite different to that. But it's, it's still got the same idea of a, a coarse guide system allowing fine electrical connection within a, a, a compliant mechanical structure. So we entered that, and uh, it was good enough to get us onto the competition which we're delighted to uh, take part in. Initial concepts uh, had some good things about it, uh, some things we didn't like. So it would be suitable for a weather raining wave energy converter. So that's good. That's a nice general kind of uh, arrangement. We had uh, got something that would provide simultaneous mechanical and electrical connection. 
uh, and we are incorporating proven technologies from other applications where we're not trying to do too much from scratch. We know some things work and we wanted to bring them forward. And certainly it would be perfectly possible to make this rugged and robust. But if you wanted to tilt the this, this catcher arm out the way, we thought, well, do you need a hydraulic control unit? We didn't want to have hydraulics. Uh, to operate the hydraulics, did you have to transfer personnel, which is risky? And this thing about this twisted riser underneath it, it doesn't have a particularly good long-term wear prospect. So these are all things that we didn't like about it. So the stage one concept design study very much focused on resolving those particular technical issues. And we ended up with the, the sketch that you see in the right there. Um, so it's still the same sort of principle. It looks a bit more like a product now. Uh, in here, um, we we realize that you just by pulling in on this work wire, which as I say, is comes off a tug, um, the plug arrangement, which goes into this receptacle, it can be guided through uh, a system which will put it in a place so that when you release tension, it locks into a, a load bearing uh, position, which also allows the electrical connection. So it, it's similar, but slightly different to that original sketch. Um, some of this is the subject of our patent application. Um, so we'll, there's only so much I can say about it at this stage. But the simplest way of looking at it is if you imagine a ballpoint pen with a, a button at the back, so you click it in, click it once and you've made a connection, you click it again and it makes a disconnection. And this is this is the effectively the, the same thing as going on here. You pull this in through a single track, release the tension, it's connected. To disconnect it, you pull in the wire again and it goes through another track and then it drops out. So uh, it's, a, it's as simple as that. And that's the, the fundamental um, uh, property of our, our concept here, which I think is quite attractive really. So long as there's downward tension, which you can arrange with the mirroring system, uh, it stays connected. Uh, it doesn't need anything else. No fancy servo actuators, no ROVs. Uh, the other thing we got, we discovered that, uh, or we, with a bit of research, we found that there are electrical swivels, which worked perfectly well for the applications that we were considering. So that got away from this problem of the twisted chain cable riser um, and uh, has a better long-term integrity. Okay, so the concept design study, was there wasn't too much engineering, um, competed for and got to stage two. And stage two uh, and got much deeper into the engineering. And in this case, we were um, looking at, we, had to, we were challenged to pick a primary test case and an alternate based on wave energy converters that are out there. So uh, two organizations worked with us in that. We were very grateful to their support. Uh, Motion Energy, uh, the device at the top right, which you may recognize, it's been very much in the news recently um, because they've just completed a, a, successful, a successful test program up in the north of Scotland. Um, so they shared a lot of information about their device. That was our, our primary test case. It was a floating device, so that suited us quite well. And then on the bottom right, Carnegie Clean Energy, which is an Australian-based company, uh, to have this uh, device I was describing earlier. And uh, we thought, well, well, let's see how we can make it work with a spread mirroring, uh, albeit a variable geometry spread mirroring. So that was uh, the other uh, party. Um, one of the things that we found by working on the Wave Energy Scotland program is we've been educated in product development. Uh, Apollo has done a lot of engineering over the years, but product development is something that we, mechanical product development is new to us. Um, uh, the Wave Energy Scotland process has been excellent in terms of guiding us uh, through the different stages and, and understanding what we have to deliver. So the stage two feed process that we went through is, is shown here, and it's, it seems obvious when you look at it, but it's, it's, it was a nice structured process. We, the whole thing had to be designed off the survival condition, the extreme environmental condition. We go through engineering design, looking at the methodology, the moorings analysis for operations as well, mechanical structural design, and selection of components. But then there was a process of evaluation. After that iterative process was complete, going into the design risk, the operational risk, a formal design review with the with the Wave Energy Scotland representation, and then going back to the developer and asking them to assess the impact that the solution has on their yield potential of the device. Uh, and finally, building that up into a cost modeling and a, a levelized cost of energy uh, impact. So that, that was really informative and really useful uh, exercise. So I, 
I think I've only got time really to talk through um, the primary test case. Uh, the Motion Blue Energy Blue X device is the one that we used. We mounted the receptacle onto the forward part of the, the body, whereas the base case has a, a bridle coming off this forward wave capture um, device uh, sort of arrangement here. Um, this, is, this is preferred both by us and by uh, motion for the purposes of the study, at least. The, uh, the device is a demonstrator scale device. It can be land transported. Um, so it's only 20 meters long and 25 ton displacement. That, but that was an ideal size for us really to, to really get into some of the nitty gritty. It's a single point mooring solution, the integrated electrical connector. Um, so there's got two mooring lines that come off here and it was tested up in Orkney. Ours was a desktop study. I have to make that clear, but uh, we were basing it on their, their test site on, up in Orkney. Uh, the, oh yes, the methodology of operation, this might be quite interesting. I, I would like to have shown you a video, but uh, it's probably easier just to do it on the storyboard here. Um, basically, you have a pre-laid mooring system and cable arrangement here with uh, the plug shown in red in the top left, buoyed off. And that's uh, put in place shortly before you bring the device into location. There's a pre-rigged uh, messenger or work wire uh, on the device. This has got to be done pretty close by um, to to avoid sort of uh, damaging the, the wires. But you bring it up closely, you grapple the, uh, the buoy to the back deck, you hook it all up and you cast over till you end up in the configuration at the bottom left. So now what you've got is a work wire passing through the receptacle from the plug up to the winch on the tug. Uh, pull in the winch and you make a connection and that's it done. All you have to do at that point is break between the purple and the green wires, tie it off and you're in place. And then to disconnect it is actually the reverse operation there. So there's a simplicity about this, but when we risk assess this with uh, the Seacroft consultant's um, master mariner, who is uh, part of the review team, um, he identified there's a lot of back deck work going on there, a lot of wires and so on. So there's room for improvement, I think, in terms of how that's happening, uh, just to make it safe. But uh, there's um, th that's the basic operation of it. Looking at the mooring system, uh, compare these. That was done in Orkflex. These two four diagrams compare the base case at the top with uh, the arrangement with um, the the, pl uh, the palm attached to it. So the base case in the extreme condition, it adopts that kind of position at the top right. Whereas with the palm, we discovered that there was uh, some potential for clashing uh, in certain configurations. So uh, that was something that had to be resolved. You you add a bit more heavy chain into the, or heavier work wire underneath the device, which gets around the problem, but there's an area for optimization there. That's one of the things we learned. And it's important to say that stage two is all about learning and doing the engineering and really learning what to make, how to make things better. The mechanical design study was based around an inventor inventor modeling, and you can see the cut through on the right hand side. So, so, so that you can see what you've got there, this is the receptacle cut through with this plug arrangement shown beside it in the working position. Uh, so it's pale blue. So basically the, the, the plug is pulling down the way, there's these orange bearing points here, and then there's an electrical connection. You can just see the electrical connection in the middle there. So as the plug has been pulled up, it's come itself, it's moved itself into a position where you drop it down and it makes all these connections. Uh, basically, we could we found we could do this with a pretty conventional carbon steel manufacturer. Um, we felt the design was quite congested and everything was sized by the size of the electrical connector. The electrical connector is an off-the-shelf product, so we're, we're dependent on uh, external parties on, on that part of it. So we, we thought there's room for improvement about the general layout, and then we started to do 3D printing of this device, and we got a few ideas about how to make the, the guide system a bit better. So all of that was pretty useful. At the end of, uh, at the, end of the stage two, we had a solution. It, it was, we found it was reducing the boat time because you're making electrical and mechanical connection at the same time and it's quite a simple operation, relatively speaking. This doesn't need specialist vessels anymore, no personnel transfer, no need for work-class ROVs or divers, got rid of the hydraulics, got rid of the servo actuation, materials for, proven for the marine environment, and uh, the feedback from the developers was there's no impact on energy capture, so that's good. And our, our modeling was demonstrating cost reductions of potentially 100,000 per device through life, through its operating life. So that's that's pretty uh, pretty useful. 
Some design risks we had identified to take forward uh, to further resolve. So the back deck handling I mentioned. Uh, marine growth, a lot of people say, well, what about marine growth in this? Is it not going to foul up the, uh, the, the track? And it's, a, it's an interesting question. We, the, the forces involved, we think, will overcome that, but it is an area to trial and test uh, going forwards. Long-term wear and corrosion, there's very, still a very dynamic environment. You have to have extra allowances for that, which is just good engineering sense. And uh, there was a few ge geometric design issues we wanted to, uh, or wanted to solve. Okay, so uh, now enter Offshore Wind. Um, the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership Project, uh, the Offshore Wind, they were running a, fu a funding competition uh, to, to move forward uh, floating offshore wind technology. We thought we had to try the palm out on a, a floating hull. And floating power plant uh, were good enough to share information about the, their hybrid wind and wave facility that you can see in this picture here. Now this is a very different animal. It's 18,000 tons in the water uh, displacement. It's a big bit of kit. That's about the size of a drilling, a second generation drilling semi-sub. Um, it's a single point moored uh, solution. The forces on the moorings are enormous. So you've got three legs holding uh, all that uh, hull in the water. So you've got legs of 1,100 ton mooring line tensions to contend with. So a very different kind of application for the palm. Power and voltage much higher uh, as well. Now, <clears throat> so we, we we worked up a solution following very much the same method, and you can see it in the right hand side here. It's uh, it's it's much larger. Uh, mechanically, it's the same principles, uh, but what we felt with something as big as that, you are very likely to have personnel on board, and if that's the case, you don't necessarily need to do a simultaneous wet mate connection. So we're now into dry mate territory and uh, with personnel on board. At that point, I think we're approaching the, the limitations of viability of, um, of this, uh, this quick connector. Um, it's, th there is some demonstrated uh, commercial advantage, but really the sweet spot we found from this study was a smaller hull, the kind of hulls that are going to be deployed in array scales on, on purely offshore wind applications. So 2,000 ton, 3,000 ton displacements. That's when you wouldn't necessarily be transferring personnel on board. That's when a, a, a simultaneous mechanical and electrical connection is a good idea. So um, it was it was really informative and uh, it gave us a lot of uh, encouragement that there's uh, applications in floating offshore wind to be had here. So you might have something like a spread moored floating hull on the left hand side. That's a fairly typical arrangement. Uh, that would be quite a good idea. The other one, the alternate test case in the wave device, you'll see um, here, we, we turned the uh, palm upside down and stuck it on the anchor pile as opposed to having it under the hull. And uh, that turned out to be quite a neat solution because all you're doing then is dropping down a mooring cable into a receptacle as uh, so long as you've cleared out any lobsters or anything that wants to want to take up residence. And, um, and then you just pull on tension and you've got something that will work on a spread mooring at the anchor level, so we were starting to do, we were starting to discover there's all sorts of potential for this uh, for this quite simple, conceptually simple mechanism. And, and in fact, down the bottom right, that's an idea of um, how you could have three mooring legs from three different devices all on the same anchor pile uh, with palm connectors on each uh, one. That's just purely mechanical connectors. So, discovering all sorts of things about this uh, this project. But meanwhile, we have to get on with the the, the main task, which is get to stage three on the wave energy program. Um, just before I move on, in terms of cost benefit modeling, uh, this is a simplified uh, calculation. We've got some fairly detailed modeling, but in, in broad terms, the capex costs of putting this palm onto the device are actually about the same as having a separate mooring connection and a separate uh, electrical connection. There's nothing particularly different about the manufacturer, so the capex costs are, can be seen to be about the same. But the installation and removal cost savings are become substantial. You don't need the same specification of tug. You're getting away with all this mechanical from all this mechanical facilitation like ROVs. Uh, you're doing a much quicker operation. So if you had to two operations for one for mooring, one for electrical, and it happens as once, you've immediately saved time and it's a simple operation. So we found it was very easy to build up a, a model that showed really quite good saving 
uh, cost savings. So we estimate in this calculation 200,000 per hull turbine through life. And if you've got an array of 50, uh, 50 hulls, then you know you can see there's quite substantial amounts of money uh, to be had. So that's that's also quite encouraging. So we're looking ahead now, uh, stage three testing. I mentioned that we are <coughs> we we are just at this exciting stage of starting to build this steel. Before that, we completed some laboratory testing. Uh, this is Richard Hay, who is very helpful from WWW Engineering Design, who 3D modeled, uh, built, 3D printed up our palm, put it into a test rig, made lots of connections, disconnections, and helped us iron out any practical details. That's that's all been done. It's given us confidence in what the prototype is going to look like. Uh, we're going to build this big rig here, which. Uh, and, and in the South Fab facility of Global Energy Group, which is just around the corner from the office here. And we're going to try all sorts of testing and, and, and basically debug everything we possibly can before we go and mount it on a multi-cat and drop some weights off Aberdeen Harbour and start pulling them in, in different conditions, which would be the site testing. At the end of that, uh, we will have tested the Palm's functionality in a representative environment, which is TRL 5.6. Uh, which is, is getting to a very interesting stage of development indeed. Just a wee word how things have changed. This is a, These are some screen jabs, grabs from a design review we did last week. Uh, you can see how far this product has come. This is our prototype design. Left hand side is still very much the same, same sort of principles. You've got a receptacle, you've got a plug device and the moorings and everything hanging off the bottom of it. Um, some ch changes in the design, we've now separated out the load bearing pieces which are down the lower gray items on the plug from the guide system, which is up the top, uh, which the guide system's got the electrical mating here. So same principle, but slightly different arrangements and, and much more refined. Uh, these items are shown in gray because for the test, we're actually going to go for 3D printed uh, um, shaped uh, items, as opposed to the expectation was it was always going to be cast. But uh, for a test that's sufficient to do 3D printing, um, and that allows us to sort of put in some quite refined shapes that allow the slickest of operations. Uh, top left, we need to do, if you're going for a long-term deployment, you'd want a much heavier gimbal, but we are having the de degrees of freedom in here. But the right-hand side shows that despite having something that's rugged and marine friendly and is all operated off a tug's winch, you still got fine engineering in there. And all at the end of the day, we have to make connections, electrical connections, which got very fine tolerances. So this is a, a feature of this device is it starts with a very coarse misalignment and allows you through a simple action to come and make a very fine connection. And it gets quite clever at that point. I, I, I've got to take my hats off to the, the team. Um, this, the, the leads on the team, uh, there's Nick Reynolds on the, the graphical design and Stephen Malloy on the, uh, the project engineer. They've put loads of creativity along with the rest of the team to solving all the different issues here. Um, I, I get to sit back and, what, uh, and admire what they're doing. But uh, there's, there's, there's things about the seatings and there's compliance and there's just sort of what sort of rattling fit is required to make this all work. And they've solved all these problems. So that's what we're going to be building up. Uh, as I say, it starts in January and uh, we start cutting steel. Uh, and looking forward to putting it through its paces. Uh, so where we're left with, uh, in terms of commercialization, the Palm design, design is on track for TRL 6 next summer. Uh, we've modeled and uh, demonstrated there's uh, LCOE reduction potential through this device, and we've got patent, we've identified where the patents are, and we've got those applications in. The markets for this, wave engine converters, floating tidal stream devices, yes, floating offshore wind is the the big exciting market is going to feature largely in Scotland, and uh, I think this product could be ready in good time for it, perfect time for that, in fact. But there's other applications, could be fish farms, floating solar, and so on. What we'd like to do next, we'd like to have an offshore demonstration project, which where we're actually integrating this fabricated kit with a wave energy or a tidal device, or even it could be a floating offshore wind hull device. But uh, um, I think the wave energy and tidal devices are at that kind of pioneering stage where um, it would be a nice fit. Uh, we'd see this as an application that could be licensed to the array deployments, probably floating offshore wind first. And uh, we're also interested in developing this anchor pile solution, which uh, is, um, uh, I don't know, it's got a lot of potential. It's, it's a bit different from what we started with. 
Okay, so that's where we got to, and that's what we're looking forward to. Uh, all that really remains for me to do in this talk uh, is to say thank you very much to the people who have got us to this stage, uh, to Wave Energy Scotland and Offshore Wind Growth Partnership for their backing, but also to the, the um, developers who have shared information and worked with us, and to um, the supply chain uh, who have just sort of done all sorts of things on, on the way. So there's, it, you, you very quickly build up to quite a large number of people who have uh, supported a project like this. But it's, uh, it's been a, f a very energizing and interesting process to get to this stage. And uh, thank you very much for, um, for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Ah, thank you very much, Nigel. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Yeah, I had a wee problem unmuting there for a minute. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. That was excellent. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here, so I'll, I'll just leap into the first one. If anyone does have any questions, if you could enter that into the attendee questions box uh, on the screen, that would be helpful for us. So the first question is, can your moving system be used for solar floating solar PV systems? Um, yes, uh, it can. It really applies to any um, floating device. Uh, it's, if you have something that needs to be towed out and uh, put in place quickly, then uh, yeah, there, there's uh, no reason why we wouldn't uh, apply it to a floating solar farm. Um, in the in the design, there's the the middle part of it is this guide guiding mechanism which makes an electrical connection, and uh, and that's a principle that we found is uh, it's, it's like a kernel in the middle of the the whole design, but it's applied in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and and whatever the device is, you adapt adapt that mechanism to make it work. So there's a combination of something repeatable uh, with original engineering design. So floating solar it depends on what the the arrangement looks like, but uh, yeah, I, I see no reason why we wouldn't. Uh, well, I see every reason to apply this to floating solar. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very similar sort of uh, application, I would imagine. Uh, maybe not quite as much uh, tension, but certainly that would work. Okay, we have a second question here. Are you talking to manufacturers of high voltage wet mate electrical connectors? Yeah, the voltage. Uh, that's a, oh, I meant to mention that. That's a good question. Um, the voltage, the wet mate voltage connectors. We have been working with uh, providers of electrical wet mate connectors. We are aware of electrical connectors up to 11 kilovolts, which uh, is slightly shy of the 66. Well, it's shy of the 66 kilovolts that are being uh, considered for the next round of floating offshore wind developments. Um, so, but I'm kind of, I would be very surprised if someone isn't working on that, uh, that scale of a wet mate connector somewhere. So we'd be very interested in talking to anyone who's got that kind of technology. Yeah, there's a couple of questions coming up about that 66, uh, and, but I think you've just answered those. So yeah, I just um, heard about 132 kilovolts uh, as being the future as well. So um, this, yeah, this, this, <laughs> that's getting pretty hefty. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see what's out there, uh, to be honest. But as I say, 11 kilovolts is what we're aware of at the moment, which is probably why it makes sense to um, align with wave energy converters at the moment uh, for the for the demonstration project. Uh, but um, yeah. Soon as soon as that technology is out there, uh, we can apply to it. What well, what we'd say the, the point uh, I skipped over it perhaps, uh, but we start with an industrial wet mate connector, uh, an off the shelf item, and then we build this device around it. So whatever is out there, we can adapt the mechanical system around it. That's that's the idea of it. Okay, yeah, a, a, a sort of sort of follow on from me there. That you only have one electrical sort of penetrator, one connection within the system. Is that correct? Uh, well, no. The last version we've got three three points of contact, so there is redundancy ah. there. And okay. that would, okay. uh, yeah. So you, whether you're working off a three phase or a single phase uh, solution, um, there's there's permutations there. But when I say electrical, it's also got to be a fiber rope connector as well, uh, because the cables that are are used and 
uh, offshore renewables. So it's not just a, an electrical conductor. It's uh, it's got quite a complex cross section. So there's all these different uh, different parts that have to be branch out and reconnect. So uh, the, yeah, the last version that the prototype that we've got there has got three points of connection. Okay, that sounds good. So we've got a question here. Um, what are the, the major perceived technical issues that you're now facing? What do you think those are going to be? Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. What are the, the big issues? Well, the big issues are for proving proving it in the in the water. Like we've done this desktop study and a laboratory skill experiment. Um, there's nothing like putting it in the marine environment to to learn a few lessons, and, and even from uh, having done stage two, we still were making refinements as we went into stage three. So, and and then when we started to 3D print it, things come to light. So, so actually, just going through that learning process of 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 building something, testing it, and seeing what happens, uh, that's that's uh, a key development. Um, the testing program that we're coming up to, we, we we slightly simplified it in that everything is going to be done off this multicat. In reality, we've got a two body floating body system. So how these two bodies interact, that is something that would uh, uh, need to work in the next stage of development. I think that's quite an important one. Um, proving for long term, the long term integrity. How much allowance do you need for uh, for wear um, in in the marine environment? That's that's quite a, an interesting area to understand. Um, so we're getting insight from doing some of the tests, but what we might do afterwards is just put the, uh, the palm in the water for a period of time and uh, and see how it gets on. And the other bit is um, the, the there's the handling back deck handling issue uh, that was flagged up as a as a, a risk area that we have to get a good handle on, um, and also this marine growth. So, so these are all things that can be tackled through um, just trialing it in the, in the the next stage and uh, and hopefully a demonstrator program after that. Yeah, marine growth that's always a problem, especially for systems laid down maybe six months to a year before you come along and reconnect the top end. So, yeah, yeah definitely yeah. marine growth can be an issue. But if okay, you have so, if you something that's so, plowing through the marine growth at a hundred. Hundred tons, then well, that might just might overcome it. Yeah, yeah, I've seen things gummed up. <laughs> seen things gummed up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so another question about this pulling in, um, and this is this is an interesting question. Do you have a spiral strand, or is it an IWRC wire rope coming into the device? I, I can see where this guy's coming from because the number of times I've seen wire ropes just spin when you put tension yeah. on them. So the question is, if so, ben, is bending fatigue a potential issue? In which, sorry, in the pull-in wire? Yeah, it's, this must be the pull-in wire we're talking about here. Yeah, if you, uh, it's a, it's an issue to be um, considered in the design. Uh, so um, in, the, in the spiral strand, whether you have a torque equalized rope or what, um, that's mm -hmm. you'd, actually you'd want torque equalized. As a, well, I think of it, that one of the things we want to get a, a handle on during the testing is will the whole system want to yaw or rotate um, as you pull in the, the loads and how do you control that? So that that's that's one thing. But in terms of the bending fatigue, uh, it could be, let's see now, um, the pull-in operation is relatively short. So in the configuration where we have a, a wire wrapped around uh, the device and using that as a short tow line for for close uh, positioning. If that went on for any length of time, I'd be worried about it. Uh, but that's that's only a close approach configuration. The whole thing is towed up using more conventional uh, technology to get into the the into the field, if you like, and then you make a short uh, short adjustment. Um, but the actual pull in operation, I don't see that the load cycles would be sufficient to cause a, bend a bending fatigue issue. Uh, it's something we could note. It's something we could look at, and it's a, mm -hmm, it's a good mm -hmm. point. Um, yeah. But fundamentally, it's a short duration of exposure. Yeah. So we're coming here. I think this is possibly about your uh, your future tests as well. Um, would the connector be subject to third party approval? You know, DNV Lloyd's. Are you, and there, are you going to bring these people in during your next testing phase? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. 
Yes, uh, quite possibly. We've had some initial conversations on the certification side of things to, to understand that. Um, it is part of the Wave Energy Scotland programme that uh, they want us to, to be clear on what's required here. Um, so the, the fundamental bit in the middle, uh, the, the patented bit, if you like, this, uh, this mechanical electrical connection, uh, that's, a, that's potentially, that would be a repeatable thing. So there may be scope for certifying that. Uh, but otherwise, I would see it as a verified, a ver verified engineering activity, in that there's a there's an idea that can be adapted to whatever the the, the hull form is or the floating device uh, through engineering. So that becomes subject a subject that would normally go through a verification process. The certification piece, I would imagine, is uh, is more about a repeatable bit of kit, if you like, something that you might have in the warehouse. Um, and yeah, maybe when you get up to a race scale, it would be useful to do uh, to do that. But we are we have had initial conversations with at least one um, certification and verification organisation, and quite happy to have conversations with all of them. Yeah, it's, it's worthwhile getting these guys involved as early as possible to get that started. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, so we have a wee question here about the recovery. Um, how does the tug get hold of the winch wire to be able to pull the pan to release the connector? So that's, that's sort of about, about how you get your wire rope to the tug. Yeah. Um, so when you have uh, installed it, so it's pre-rigged. Um, so uh, you can do the pre-rigging in the in the port before you depart. So that that's that's okay on the way out. Uh, when you then hook it all up, there is a, a loose wire which has to stay at the moment. It has to stay as part of the system. So what you do is, uh, what we imagine is there would be a tie-off arrangement in some fashion. So maybe maybe there's a, a socketed end that has to come along and just tie against a, a pad eye um, through a, a work boat or something like that. The, it is an area that has to be uh, looked at in detail when we get to offshore operations. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you need to keep the, the wire as part of the system. That, that's where we are at the moment. Yeah, you have pennant wires hanging off the, some of the rigs, you know, for the for the anchors, that sort of thing. So maybe you need yeah, to get your pennant wire system into place. Something yeah, it's analogous to the the tow bridle in a semi sub, for example. You'd have it uh, tied off in some fashion, uh, yeah. but it's something that you know, if you've got this working for any length of time, it is an issue. Uh, you've mm -hmm. got it working for any length of time in a marine environment. Um, it's got to be well tied off. You know, you don't want Absolutely. that to go walk about because uh, that defeats the purpose, if you like, if you can't quickly hook up. Yep. So uh, a question here about natural disasters and, and facing some of these things like tsunamis or whatever. How reliable yeah. is the system against that? Have you looked at that in your design review? Uh, we haven't done the perfect storm, no. Uh, mm -hmm. We have done the 100-year storm, um, which, uh, yeah, the... the the designs have always been uh, demonstrated against the hundred year case, but we haven't looked at um, the exceptional case, like the 10,000 or anything like that. Uh, yeah, yeah I'd, it, it, it would, that's where perhaps the verification organization can come along and say, well, you need to test against this. Uh, fundamentally, what's it going to do? It's going to increase the mooring loads. It's going to increase the interface loads. Um, yeah. yeah, it's designable. And at what point do you, you sort of say, okay, this is uh, this is the point where we we say this is like a fusible link, and we just uh, release sort of thing. You know, is there some point where you say that's it's no it's not designed to move the system completely if, in some cases. So, yep. Oh, it would be analogous to any other moored solution that um, yeah. You know, yeah. if you if you have a a semi sub out there, you wouldn't want it to go walk about. So it's uh, it has to be. You you might design it with zero safety factor against uh, the extreme uh, extreme if you like, uh, but uh, you'd normally design to a hundred years and, and consider that to be the appropriate ultimate limit state. And also, any mooring solution uh, you have to design for a single line failure case at least, anyhow, because mooring systems tend to fail. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is one of the problems maybe with uh, a three leg. Uh, moorings that are under, under consideration that if a mooring line parts then you've got a gross excursion of the hull and then if there's a, if it parts for a reason that is uh, in any way systematic you could have other mooring line failures quite quickly so this is an industry uh, an issue that i think the industry has to has to address uh, which is what level of redundancy do they want in the mooring systems um, but yeah you, you normally have an accidental limit state which would include at least one mooring line failure yeah yeah 
Okay. So we have another question here. Uh, one important aspect of the floating wind of a tow to port strategy is maintaining electrical continuity in the series where a turbine is removed. Okay. Uh, you had any thoughts about how that would work with the palm? Uh, very good question. Um, <laughs> there would it would have to be in the plug. Uh, we we've just kind of got uh, got insight into that talking to. Uh, partners we have with uh, Vector Group, they were providing some insight on in that recently. And uh, yeah, you'd have to maintain the electric and the electrical continuity and the, the plug arrangement, I would have thought. Um, so we haven't engineered that yet, but we're aware that it's an issue. Okay. Um, so I noticed that you talked about Wave Energy Scotland and, and, and this whole thing. Do you know of any of this being done in other parts of the world? I know that there's a uh, there's a lot of talk of wave energy over in Japan. Do you know if anyone else is working down these same sort of lines? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, let's think now. That's a that's an interesting question on wave energy. Uh, there's the stuff going on in the eastern seaboard of USA. Um, uh, I'm aware of that. I, I think there's wave energy. I think is is quite widespread. So Carnegie. Uh, Clean Energy, who we worked with, have, are based in the south of Australia. Um, there's there's quite a lot of uh, yeah. I, there's a, there are other parts of the world that are looking at that. Um, Simic Atlantis there have put tidal stream into Japan fairly recently. Uh, I saw a demonstrator case, and then the floating offshore wind piece as well. That's uh, that's very interesting to Southeast Asia. Uh, I think uh, personal opinion. I think we've got a great opportunity to maintain a lead. In uh, in the UK, uh, on these technologies and and to export them uh, because we're we're solving the issues uh, properly uh, in real time now and and that can be exported if we have the right uh, right environment economic environment. But it, it's it, it's of interest and I think it's just going to get bigger as you go uh, as time goes by in the coming decade. I think more and more places are going to to look for this kind of technology. Uh, as for quick connection systems, there are other quick connection systems out there. We're aware of some. And we've seen some uh, in, in tenders and so on. And uh, yeah, th there's quite good publications available. There's a lot of information through the RRE Catapult, through Carbon Trust, Wave Energy Scotland, and other organisations there. Um, if anyone wants to look into that. Okay, so we've got only time left for one last question here. So, um, okay. so back on this disconnection, you know, this uh, if you had to take it out with. Uh, with respect to the control of the lazy wave buoyancy on the export right. cable, what's your plan for the actual disconnection to control that? That's quite open. That's an open issue. Um, so I don't. Believe, we haven't uh, looked into detail on that. So it'd be very interesting to have a conversation with anyone who uh, has particular uh, feedback on that area. Um, but yeah, the. The idea, the initial idea, was that the plug would be a buoyant structure, and uh, it'd be, if you like, analogous to a STL type mooring, where uh, well, after disconnection it sits below the surface but not on the seabed. So uh, you have the rise or the cable lazy wave or whatever it is is uh, designed to con comply with that arrangement, as is the moorings. Um, what we, we haven't got that in the current prototype because we don't need to. Uh, we're just doing a, a test and uh, we can drop the plug down to the seabed and bring it back up if we want to. But if uh, I suppose the best answer I can give you is in a real life application, the the node or the, the plug will sit halfway up the water column uh, through buoyancy. And that's how we would control uh, risk to the uh, cable. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, Nigel, thank you very much. I've learned a lot myself about this. This was not any of my areas, so I've, I've learned a lot. So I'd like to thank you for the presentation and answering all these questions. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear from you in the future once you get this thing up and running and into some applications. Yeah, well, well thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to present, and it's been a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's uh, look forward to getting those uh, test results back and, and being able to share those as well. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good Christmas. Yeah.